So I just want us to cast our memories back in terms of what Corinthians says, all right? And I want us to remember that our bodies are considered the temple of the Holy Ghost, all right? And when we bear that in mind, I want us to treat it with the respect that it deserves, all right? So you're not doing it because, boy, I don't want to get sick or I want to live as long as possible. But as Christians, it's more than that, all right? All bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, and we will treat it with the respect that it deserves. Also, another important concept, specifically in my life, is the concept of holistic medicine. And we think we could separate our physical being from our spiritual and our emotional well-being, but that's not so, all right? When we talk about holistic medicine, we're really talking about the art of the science that deals not only with the body, but also the mind and spirit. And I'm sure you know that some ailments are not confined to the body. Some of them deal with the mind and spirit. That's why we have different aspects of medicine. So for us to think it is just our physical beings, and once we are in tip-top shape, we go to the gym every day, we exercise, we eat salads and vegetables only, that, that's, that everything is well, we must recognize that there are other aspects to contentment, to fulfillment, and that's where our spiritual well-being um, comes into play, all right? The practice of holistic medicine integrates not only the conventional or what we will call alternative medicine. And I'm going to tell you all a little something about me. If you come and tell me you're drinking a little ginger or sour sap bush, I say, if you check your blood pressure and it's okay, then go and drink your ginger. Right? I'm not going to say, no, 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 you need to take your blood pressure medication because that's what I know. If your pressure normal, why am I making you take medication? Right? If your pressure is still high, then I say, what do you think? Right? It's working? <laughs> you know? So we want really to promote optimal health. So the aim of this talk is to really raise awareness of not only the impact of diabetes, hypertension um, on the church, but also on the family. And as a church, we also now have to create support networks for those affected in our population, in our congregation. And if we think we don't have persons affected with diabetes, I know that's a big misconception. We want to promote the role of the family and the church in the management, in the care, in the prevention, and sessions like these promote the education of persons on these illnesses, as well as learn what the warning signs are for these illnesses as well. So when we talk about diabetes, what we're really talking about is sugar. Straightforward, sugar. So we're talking about elevated blood sugar levels. But guess what? We're not really only talking about the elevated blood sugar levels, but we want to talk about it as a whole entity. So what we see is elevated blood sugar levels, but they didn't just get high all of a sudden. And the common misconception is that but that I don't eat sweet thing, right? Anybody ever heard that? How I get sugar and I don't eat cake? Does cake alone have sugar? What we have to understand is that the concept of diabetes affects carbohydrates or starches as we call it. It is affected by proteins or meats and it's affected by fats. So these things break down and help to produce high blood sugar levels. Some things would spike your sugars a little bit faster than others. You see, like mango season, problems, problems. <laughs> I have perfectly well-controlled persons with diabetes who three months ago come in and I say, well done, you're looking nice. And I say, what happened? I say, boy, that's a mango tree in my yard. I say, and I say, what happened to you? You don't have church members you could give. You don't have anybody you could share your mangoes with. That it's hard to resist. I say, yes, but this is where discipline comes in. Right? So, yes, the bananas, the mangoes, the pineapples, the traditionally sweet foods can spike it. Your sugar level is very high, but we have to learn 
self-discipline and self-control. All right? These are some frightening statistics. Um, when we talk about diabetes, we're looking at over 400 million persons worldwide with diabetes. All right? All over the world, there's not one country where you have the incidence of diabetes falling. And you expect it to increase. All right? You're thinking about every 10 persons worldwide, 11 persons, at least one person has diabetes. I don't think St. Vincent has reached that far yet, but we're really heading there. All right? Um, there are different types of diabetes. Sometimes, you know, persons who they get it at a very young age and they need to use insulin right away, and that is the only medications that would work. Whereas the majority of persons who have diabetes, they can have, um, they can take tablets, or sometimes they might be able, able to just change their diet and start exercising and have diabetes. All right? So we're looking at even a more expected precipitous jump um, of diabetes coming forward. So they are expected in the next almost 10 years, 12 years, we're seeing over 50% increase in diabetes. And I don't think we want to be a part of that statistic, all right? If we look at the distribution of where it is happening, we say Caribbean ranks third. South and Central America, Africa, North America, and the Caribbean. It's expected to go where more than one in three persons have diabetes if it, project, if it continues to prog project, pro progress at the current rate that we have it progressing at. So this is not a competition we want to win. We want to lose this one. Agreed? Yeah. All right. I think we're going to run to lose this one. So we have days where we celebrate diabetes and where we talk about it they have a world diabetes day and they talk and give you all these information in terms of diabetes but it has to be more than once a year that we're going to talk about diabetes and go from there all right we have to decide how we're going to make the diagnosis so does the doctor just want to tell me i have sugar but just so my sugar good all the time and now you're just telling me sugar i don't feel sick i feel fine right First of all, we have some numbers that we're going to look at, okay? You don't necessarily have to have a glucose monitor if you're not, um, don't have a history of diabetes, but if you have someone in your family, mother, father, brother, sister with diabetes, you better check your sugar, right? It's called genes. You don't get to choose them, you're born with them, all right? Sometimes you can delay how um, soon you get diabetes or lifestyle changes may prevent you from getting it but if you have a predisposition in your family it makes no sense to say no 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 I rebuke that we hear that all the time I rebuke that but in the meantime you're thirsty all the time you're peeing every minute you're losing a whole set of weight and you know when you lose weight in St. Vincent is problems is either cancer or AIDS true yeah. Nobody ain't saying diabetes, but that's one of the ways in which diabetes infect. And you say, big woman like me, how I get trash in my mouth? Oh, you're getting yeast infections all the time. These are some of the other things that you can have with diabetes. So there's some specific numbers that you can look at. You can change the slide for me. Um, if that blood sugar level, you wake up first thing in the morning and you check that blood sugar level and it's over 126 or any time of the day and and um, persons like to say, but I can just eat. I say, I know. I'll adjust it for that. If you just eat, if you eat two hours ago, or if you were fasting for eight hours, the numbers are different. But whether you just eat or not, your sugar shouldn't be over 200. All right? Or if your meter reading in the opposite numbers, it shouldn't be over 11. All right? Why do we care? Diabetes attacks every single blood vessel in your body small and large right damages every single blood vessel all right we look at it damaging the heart it damages the eyes it damages the kidneys it damages the nerves um, that's why it's important to keep your blood sugar levels normal or as near normal as possible persons who are on dialysis the vast majority of persons on dialysis are because of diabetes. 
most cases up to 40% of the entire dialysis population have di are on dialysis and the kidneys fail because of diabetes, all right? So we can't ignore it and say, boy, I feel all right, I young. And I see a lot of young persons who are diagnosed with diabetes doing that. It's a very bad mistake, all right? Because the damage is being done over several years and then we have significant complications associated with it. So there are instances, as I said before, where if you have a family history of diabetes, you should get checked, regardless of if you have no symptoms at all, all right? Hands up if you have somebody in your family with diabetes. All right. Everybody have a family history of diabetes. Some persons may have a personal history of diabetes. If you know somebody in your family who has diabetes and you haven't had your blood sugar yet checked, you should have it checked, okay? You tell your primary care doctor, you tell your district doctor, you know what, my mother, my brother, my sister has diabetes. I'm over 30, I'm over 35. I want to know if my sugars are abnormal and what I need to do. It causes less anxiety because you know, hey, check my sugar and they're good, right? Or, uh, wow, I don't have diabetes, but the sugar not quite normal. You know, they have the pre-diabetes and now you have the opportunity to make some lifestyle changes that could get it back, pull it back into normal because then it might go into what we call full-blown, as persons like to say. So you want to do that. What do we have? Always tired. And I'm not talking about persons who are doing a little course by you. we on the side. Or you're working security in the night. Or you're working a night shift. And you're tired because you now have to hustle and get the children ready for school. And then you're doing something else. Or you're caring for the elderly. Or you're hustling two jobs and you're tired because of that. It's a different tired. I said, Doc, trust me, I'm tired. All right? So persons complain of being tired all the time. They're always hungry. They're eating, they're eating, they're eating. And guess what? They're losing weight. They're saying, all the food you're eating and you can't gain weight, you're losing weight. So you see the person losing weight despite having a ferocious appetite. Every minute they're in the bathroom. Every minute they're peeing. All right? They can't hold the pee. As they drink water, they pee. Drinking a lot of water. Yes, sun, hot, sun real hot these days. Agreed? Yeah. Yes. So you're drinking a bit extra water. But I say, I would ask a construction guy, I say, you've been peeing more often? They say, well, I drink plenty of water. I say, but you've been a construction worker all your life. You say, but it's hot. It's hot outside all the time. I say, have you been drinking more? The doctor drinking a gallon of water a day. I say, what do you mean a gallon? They say, like, yeah, a gallon. I say, and what? They say, well, I'm paying a lot. That's why I'm paying a lot. I say, but is that normal? No, I used to carry a little cooler to work and drink that over the day. Right? So, in our minds, sometimes we could explain away symptoms. Well, I thirsty, so I drink. If I drink plenty, I must be plenty. Right? But that is different from what you are used to. So, we see the frequent urination. Men started having sexual problems, and we're in church, but we could still talk about it. Yes? They start realizing, boy, something not working quite right. And that's when a lot of men come to the hospital. And that's when they go into the doctor. Now I say, boy, you have sugar 10 years now. The ship has sailed. Right? It can cause impotence and sexual problems. All right? And when they hear that, they say, boy, let me try to fix my sugar. Right? But we need to fix it before the fact because at that point it is too late most of the times. All right? You start feeling tingling or numbness in the feet. You start to affect the nerves. All right? Always thirsty. Your vision getting blurred. Vision get blurred and you say, why? It clear up in eye. Yesterday it was blurred. Or you're reading your text and you, you go to the eye doctor. And a lot of the times the eye doctor send persons to us as internal medicine physicians and say, I can't give you glasses just yet. Your sugar is too high. All right? Your sugar is too high. Because diabetes makes the vision blurred. You drink some water, the sugar go down, the vision clear up. So on any given day, your vision clear, blurred, and is going with how high the sugar spike at the time. All right? You get a cut. You get cuts before, and you say, but this little scratch can't heal at all. 
what's going on, you start having problems with wounds healing. All right? What do we do? We make the diagnosis of diabetes. Either you don't have any symptoms at all, and you go and get checked because, as we said, you had a family history and you wanted to find out, or you go, you had symptoms, you were thirsty all the time, peeing all the time, losing weight, you're getting yeast infections and so forth, um, you realize that you're feeling lightheaded. Some people actually pass out. They go into comas, all right, because of how high the sugars are at the time. Some persons develop kidney failure uh, because of it, if it goes on for quite some time. And then they go and they make a diagnosis that yes, you actually in fact have diabetes. What do you need to do? There's a special diet, all right? You can't eat the same when your body is not metabolizing the carbohydrates and the proteins and fats the same. You say, but doctor, you can't give me medication. I say, yes, I can. But you still have to change your lifestyle. So regardless of whether initially we think you need to be on medication, your lifestyle has to change. All right? So that goes with the diet. Imagine a group of persons sit down and decide, hey, we're going to tell you how much exercise you need to do. They're bored, right? So they're going to say, hey, for the week, 150 minutes of exercise. That's not difficult. We watch plenty more TV than that. Right? So half an hour a day, five days of the week, that's all that's required. Just that, whether you're doing a little bit of walking or while you're watching the news, you have two little weights and you're doing some exercises or you're marching on the spot in your house or you're doing a little bit of skipping or while you lie down on the bed, you're doing some foot raises. Don't have to be exotic or you like the beach, so you're not worried about your hair. I see some sisters with some beautiful hairstyles. You're not worried about it. Yes, we know it's a problem. <laughs> right? You're not worried about your hair, so you're going to take a little swim. Or, uh, you know what? sister's group could go walking sometimes on a Saturday, right? So, depending on how the weather, all right, or they move the chairs aside and we do a little bit of aerobic session too, right? All of that would count as our exercise. Unfortunately, that's not enough for everybody. Some persons need tablets, and tablets work very well, all right? Lots of different options. Significant variation also in the prices, all right? but they work, okay? Sometimes people initially start on tablets and then we have to go and say, hey, this is not working anymore. We have to switch you over to insulin. That is usually a very traumatic conversation for a lot of persons. Um, but I usually try to give patients a head where I say, look, you're on the maximum amount of tablets. I have you on three diabetes tablets already and your sugar's high. I don't want you to lose your toes. I don't want your sugars to be out of control. We probably have to do something differently, all right? You're already doing your prescribed exercise. You're already um, eating pretty healthy. Um, we probably have to change something up, all right? Ignoring it doesn't make the sugars get better, all right? It just allows the sugars to be higher for a longer period of time, and with that, start damaging the organs, all right? Um, how does it affect um, the family, how does it affect the church? Eye disease, blindness. You can't read your Bible, right? You can't read the message that they send in church. And this don't even have to go for blindness. Diabetes, the initial short episodes that I told you about, once you fix the sugars, that is better. Eh? The off and on, blurring of the vision, that gets better once the sugars are there. But diabetes cause something called retinopathy. And once you are diabetic, if anybody in here is a diabetic and you have not checked your eyes for the year, you need to go and get your eyes checked. And the specific question you're going to ask your eye doctor is, has diabetes affected the back of my eyes? All right? It doesn't work silently. Something like the church, but not in a good way. Right? It affects the back of the eyes. It causes new vessels to form. These vessels are very weak. They break. You bleed in the back of your eye, next thing you know, you're blind. All right? It is treatable if it is caused early. It's a preventable or, or you could decrease the severity in which the visual change is associated. So you ain't going to just throw up your hand and say, well, don't go so. Right? Preventative measures um, are important. The kidney disease we spoke about, again, this is not something dramatic. And as you would see with kidney diseases generally, 
when you start getting symptoms, it's very late. All right? So that is why if you are known to have diabetes and you have not, and, and we're not asking anything ridiculous, eh? Not every Monday morning you're in your doctor's office. That's not necessary. Okay? The eye disease, once a year. Same thing with the kidney disease. You check your urine to see if you're leaking proteins. That is the earliest manner in which diabetes appears. So if you're on tablets for your diabetes, first five years ago, you're checking as soon as you get diagnosed. If you had to start on insulin, you could even wait a five years because you don't expect the kidneys to be damaged that quickly. All right? So check to see if you're leaking protein. Any district clinic could do it. You're not leaking protein? Wonderful. You're leaking protein a little bit. Guess what? You have medication to decrease that. Some of the same blood pressure medications that you use can also decrease the protein that you leak, okay? So that's important to note. Not only that, some of the same diabetes medications that the doctor can prescribe can decrease the protein. Why is that important? It delays further damage to the kidneys. So we don't want you leaking protein since leakage of proteins from the kidneys further damage the kidneys. Is that clear? You're following me or getting a little highfalutin here? All right. All right. So that is as it relates to the kidney disease. The heart disease. I don't like the heart disease part. Guess why? Because you could have your sugar nice, nice, nice. All your years, you have diabetes for 20 years. Your sugar is well controlled. And you could still get a heart attack and stroke because of it. So patients ask me, why, why bother then? I say, well... It decreases the chance of blindness. It decreases the chance of nerve damage. It decreases the chance of kidney failure. What do you mean, why bother? Right? So, yes, some things we can help, but the process by which it affects the bigger blood vessels, which are in the heart and in the brain and sometimes in the feet, we, don't, we ain't figure that part out as nicely. All right? So, it can still put you at risk for strokes and heart attack above somebody who does not have diabetes. So me and you 50, I have diabetes you don't have. The chance of having a stroke with my diabetes is higher than you who don't have diabetes, all right? Or a heart attack, same thing, all right? Nervous system and the blood vessels, it starts affecting the nerves, right? So you hear patients say, boy, doc, trust me, just yesterday I smelled my foot and my foot ain't smell good at all and I look, and my foot rotten. And I was like, that really ain't just happened yesterday. I said, no, doc, serious thing. Guess why? You walk on a thumbtack last week and you don't even know. You don't sense it. The sensation to the feet becomes impaired. All right? So that's important why we're telling people, yes, the heels look nice. You come to church and all your life, I remember my grandmother hold me up in her heart for that, you know. I said, granny, she loved her pedicures and she loved high heel shoes. I say, where you going with that? Look at foot blister. You don't even know. So she tell me how I make her wear ugly shoes go church now. Right? But you stand up, you can your foot and you don't know. Then it don't heal. Then you lose your toe. Then you lose your foot. Right? So because of that impairment of um, the sensation, your feet and your sensation should be assessed once a year, all right? So, you know, you check with a little vibration hammer, you check with a little cotton wool. You yourself know sometimes, and you say, Doc, I have a little tingling. I get a little numbness sometimes in the evening. That is the nerve impairment often seen with diabetes, all right? So it is important that we know this in advance. So when you're bathing, you sit down and you dry your foot and you look underneath because the vision okay still. All right? Or if you see a crack between your two, you're more circumspect about it. And you say, well, let me make sure, watch this and monitor this and make sure it ain't getting red or anything. Or let me ask a question. And you're checking your sugar and you say, ah, oh, my sugar reached 400. Hmm. Something brewing. Right? That's how the infections travel. As simple as that. People step on a thumbtack, have a splinter of wood in their foot, and the next thing you know, you're losing the foot. That's not being dramatic to say, or oh, not every time you step on a splint, if you're diabetic, you're going to lose your foot. But recognizing the risk allows us to decrease the risk. All right? 
So we talk about the foot disease and the nerve impairment. And you hear me saying, that shoe need a little bit more cushion. All right? Let's get the foot a little bit more cushion. The gunslingers ain't really walking in because the nail going to go through it the same way. Right? Or the heel completely exposed. You're walking on gravel. You're walking on a road, a, a dirt road somewhere, some grass. You don't know what's in the grass. You get cut, you get stuck, and you cause problems. All right? We're not even talking about the financial impact. The cost of medication. You know, some diabetic medications could cost up of $250 a month. Yes, you get a lot of them from the district clinics and so forth for, what, a $5, $4 stamp? $5 stamp. But if you go to the pharmacy and you want the newer medications, like the one that decrease your protein and so forth, they're going to cost you up of $150, $250 a month. Right? The majority of our population don't have health insurance. Right? So these are realistic things. We're talking about the cost of treating complications, the cost of dialysis. The actual cost of dialysis is about $750 a session, you know. Yes, the cost is subsidized, and you're going three times a week. So when you're going three times a week and spending four hours on the machine, how are you working? Right? The cost of managing the complications. The diabetic foot, you stay in the hospital for weeks and months, cleaning that foot every day, trying to save the foot, and then eventually having it amputated. Now you have it amputated, you can't come out to night service. Right? You can't come out to night service or the vision gone bad. So now you have to have somebody at home to help you. You can't afford somebody at home, but your relatives need to go to work to be able to assist you to buy your medication. You see how the thing set up? Right? These are the realities that we face as a society and also as a church. We don't get exempt as a church from the realities of society. All right? The social implications... We have the loss of breadwinners. All right? We have the loss of breadwinners in the home. Father used to go out and work. He had diabetes. He was working on a construction site or wherever. He cut his foot. Next thing you know, two off. Can't wear the seat or steel tip shoe. They say, hey, you can't walk without the steel tip shoe. That's my liability, yeah? Gone. Home. Right? Increasing the blindness, increasing amputations, dependency on a more aging population. And you know your sister children overseas, your church sister children overseas, you know she can't come out here passing right in front of her house on a Sunday could bring her. Yeah? Yes? Church I ain't hearing nobody answer. Yes? You have a nice car, you could bring her. They say she ain't help you buy gas. But they're coming in the same direction. Right? We are the salt. We're talking about no our taxes. Because more people know on what they call it, poor relief. We are think paying poor relief. The working population. Right? When the sister in the church can't afford any food. We are think helping the church pick up the slack too. Right? So these are real. Now we have more shut-ins. We have to visit them and figure out how we're managing them and create a network to include them in our activities as well. We talk about even though you're able to work. Switch aside for me. To work, you have increased number of sick days. Long leave. You had an amputation. You have to wait till all the swelling go down. Decreased productive. With productivity, the sugar ain't good, but you can't even read the document the boss sent on your desk there for you to see. I go do that tomorrow. My sugar, the hay right, high right now. So you're just drinking water, and you're at the desk, and you ain't do nothing today. You can't read the document. All right? Medically boarded. So you have a 45-year-old who had another 15 years of working. They say, nah. One toe off, two toes off, foot off, hand off. What are we going to do in the workforce? Right? Decreased mobility, early retirement, interruption of exams, exemption from certain jobs, bullying at school. You won't even believe it. Children getting mean, you know. Children getting mean. Social isolation, depression, and anger. You think the church exempt from all of these things? Absolutely not. We have premature deaths. 
whether it's from the heart disease or the blood sugar run low because you didn't have a meter or you couldn't afford to buy the strips, they change your medication because it's running too high and then the sugar drop and you don't wake up, right? Infections, the kidney disease, all of these are real complications. It takes a village and that village includes the church, all right? We have to educate all communities. So I talk to a nice group of you here today and you go home and I say, well, let me check my sugar in the morning. Well, let your neighbor check her sugar too now. Right? Yeah, you tell him you check your sugar here now. Your brother had diabetes and he was on dialysis. You better check and make sure you're okay. Tell somebody. Because if everybody here tell two persons, we're real good, you know. Right? We talk about compliance with meds. And we must exercise wisdom. Because people say, Doc, I'm praying for healing. Right? I believe if you have objective evidence that the sugar is better than fine, but if you come and your sugar is still 400, I say, look, we have to exercise wisdom. Right? Monitoring for the complications which we spoke about. The eyes, the feet, the nerve, we're checking to see if you're leaking the proteins, preventative measures, vaccinations, and I'm talking about controversial COVID vaccines and so forth. The influenza vaccine, the annual vaccine for that. Those things increase your chance of death when you are diabetic and heart disease. Insurance schemes. So if you know your parents had diabetes, you better go apply for health insurance before you get it. Right? They could ask you about your family history, fine. But you know that they ended up on dialysis and couldn't afford in the end. Or you couldn't get to the, to the judge down to get the dialysis. You have a good job. Your job have insurance. Join your insurance at your job. Right? These are simple, straightforward things. Police have insurance. You're in police force and you say, can't bother with them there. Then you end up on dialysis. Right? So encouraging healthy lifestyles as a church, as a community, these are the things. What we're going to do, we're still going to keep calm, but we're going to check our blood sugars levels. All right? Now we're going to talk about a little problem here. Pressure. Right? We don't want to create pressure. You know, like... Well, I can't even say West Indies cricket because that, that is headache. That's different from pressure. But back in the day, in my youthful day, I was an avid cricket fan. And you know you want to hear about high scores. This is not the time that you want high scores. Eh? When you're talking about hypertension, you don't want that. Okay? So in this case, a new high score is not a good thing. Okay? If you're playing cricket, you're playing basketball, then we say, yes, let's embrace that. But otherwise, mm -mm, we're going we to pass on that, okay? Now, to diagnose hypertension, you have elevations of your blood pressure. So you're talking about a blood pressure of over 130 on 80. And that number actually used to be higher. They used to say 140 on 90. But then they realized, you know, People getting the blood pressure down to 140, 90, and still getting problems and complications of hypertension. They realized it was inadequate, so they dropped the numbers. Now, dropping the numbers mean more people became hypertensive. And they're like, are you sure this is what you want to do? Um, you want to make sure you didn't have any recent coffee. Hopefully nobody here smokes. You were comfortable. You were in a warm environment. Um, you don't have any symptoms. Um, then you're going to say that this blood pressure is elevated. To be fair, we're not just taking a one reading. We just run from a dog up the road and your pressure high. <laughs> and I say, boy, them neighbors need to tie their animal in. <laughs> your pressure high. And we say, boy, she have hypertension. No. We want ideal situations where you're unbothered, you're well rested, you didn't have any coffee or anything to say that would increase your blood pressure. All right? And then you make a diagnosis of hypertension. All right? Sodium is a big part of that. All right? Um, major part of table salt. My sister went to Union Island last week and went salt picking. I said, girl, where you bring all that salt in this house here for? Not only the salt is actually salter than regular salt. Right? Salter than regular salt. I took a little grain and I'm like, whoa, let me go check my pressure. You know? So we have access. So when we're talking about where the salt of the earth, that's not what they mean, eh? 
right? It's not for us to be eating it and getting high blood pressure over it. In processed meat, so people are going to tell you, I don't want to add salt to my food. I say, I hear you, but you're eating ham, you're eating bacon, you're eating sausage, you're eating the cold cuts. Foods of convenience. A lot of these things in the packages are packed with sodium, all right? The canned foods, the restaurant foods, oh, we're going out with our family, mothers, they're not cooking, I'm going to, everybody's going to go out, all right? Anything on a tray. And me and the vendors does fetch I say, look, this is the age at which children acquire the taste for salt. Dams of pack of salt. Ripe plum has salt. Green plum has salt. Mango has salt. So these are sweet fruits. You know? So even from that very young age, children in society acquire the taste. All right? So we're not even showing, and everybody know a chow chow. I love a chow chow. And my son discovered it, and I was horrified because I said, let me eat it with pepper. <laughs> so, but that, that is one of the realities of the things that happen. All right? Um, initially, if the pressures are elevated, it's not just, again, this thing about your good doctor, and doctor not give me no tablets. She not a good doctor. Right? Sometimes you don't need tablets. And the lifestyle changes are also important, or that is actually the first line therapy. All right? So your pressure is elevated. Whether or not you're prescribed medications, these are the things that have to do. All right? If you're overweight and you lose weight, you know your pressure could come down. For every 10 kilograms you lose, you could drop down the pressure by one for every kilogram. Right? So if your pressure just barely elevated, all I need to do is drop off some weight. Right? Watching the salt in the diet. If you used to love a lot of salt and the pressure is minimally elevated, you cut back. You don't need medication for that. If you used to watch the salt, yes, you cut down on that. You start eating more fruits and vegetables. You start getting active. That could decrease the blood pressure by varying amounts. You monitor your alcohol intake. Right? Nobody say, you can't have a little glass of wine. But you're going to drink three beer by a rum shop? No, that is not the church. And it has medical implications as well. How are you going to do it? You're going to cut back on these frozen foods. You're going to use fresh foods. All right? I listened to a very interesting talk um, a few years back by Hilary Beckles. I think he's the pro vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Barbados. And I didn't like history. I was a science student. Maths, physics, chemistry, biology. As soon as I could drop history, I did. It, I just didn't think it was practical or relatable, and that's the truth. But he made me appreciate it and go back a little bit. And he said, he compared it to slavery. And he said that slavery actually changed our DNA. And I could see a link with that. He said, Africans were farmers and hunters. They traversed the sea for weeks on end and they gave them corn food alone to eat. And then they come over, still corn a lot of things, was cheap meat, preserving of the meats. So they, they, they couldn't go out and fish, they were walking the lands all the time. So preserved meats, low diet in fruits and vegetables, and heavy carbs. And you know, we celebrate Captain Bly and the breadfruit, and I love it daily. But these were things to cut down their cost and their expenditures. And what he said as a region, and it is scientific fact when we look at all the data, and even here, is that we have an increased number of persons who are on four and five blood pressure medications, and you can't get it controlled. One person argued and said, well, that then I mean that's the normal for them. I say it can't be the normal for them if they're having damage to their organs because of the hypertension. If your heart shape is changing because of the hypertension, if your blood vessels are getting narrowed because of the hypertension, it cannot be a normal state. All right, so he linked it to that and said that, hey, the genetics change where it's even difficult to control the blood pressure, and I see it on a regular, on a daily basis. So 
when they talk about limiting the salt intake because of what we call salt sensitivity, where we just have a more exaggerated response. If you're prone to it, it, is, it has historical correlations as well, all right? Um, you want to treat meat, and this is specific for hair, because you know, St. Vincent, they say, not even no meat, pan, that little piece of meat they give me, me a big man, right? One drumstick. My big man, you watch man give me one drum sick. Three pieces of meat. Three piece meal, right? We go to the places that have high in sodium and we still want three pieces of meal, right? And then the pressure high and your surprise. Hmm? Big man, watch man give me a drumstick, right? <laughs> Everybody familiar with that, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when I send you to the dietitian now, Everybody vexed. I said, not me, me tell you that. I send you to the dietitian. Just follow what she told you. Yeah? <laughs> so we think about it. Um, we could spice it up. All right. You could cook without the sauce. Cut back on the frozen meats. Thankfully, we have seeds that are, and we have a lot of fresh uh, meats that we have available here. We cut down on the canned foods. We spice up the thing. We put a little ginger in the food, you know, we'll put a little celery, we'll put a little side, you have your kitchen garden, use your stuff, use your stuff, all right? So it ain't only salt alone could flavor food, all right? So we get creative with it. Those of you who already have the trick, you share it with the sisters in terms of what they need to do to decrease the salt. The next thing we're going to talk about a little bit is obesity, and then I think I'm going to wrap up here and allow for some questions. Um, and we see this where we don't even know we overweight sometimes. We watch people who normally we talk about their maga. And you need a little fresh on your bone. And they say, yes, man, she nice and shapely. I overweight. I know I overweight. So when they say, no, 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 you're good that size. When you lo lose to weight, your head look big. <laughs> I say, but that's my head. <laughs> my head ain't changed size at this age. <laughs> I look back at some picture and I say, boy, my head look big for true, but... <laughs> <laughs> but that was me at a weight where I ain't getting joint pains, right? And you wonder why you need... If I give you a 50-pound sack of flour until you carry it wrong whole day, every day, you could say, I wicked. So when you put on the extra weight, an extra 20 pounds, an extra 30 pounds, and you're carrying it around on all your joints, how you ain't wicked? <laughs> Only me wicked, right? Right? So we have to think of things in these things. We're seeing not only adults who are overweight, but children or children now are becoming overweight. And I think it's a lot of our socialization. I don't know about your family, but mine, if you're going beach, you carry something for eat. Yes? Or when you're done, you buy something to eat. You're going a football game, you carry something for eat. You're going church. I had special sisters meeting and they said, let me prepare some refresh refreshments <laughs> because what? Well, more people will come. Right? True? Yes. Guilty. Yeah. All of us guilty. If you add food to any event, you get more people coming. Right? So it go back to very small. I tell people, I say, if we go and play cricket or if we go and beach, why do we have to carry food? We're spending two hours on the beach. Why, why y'all want me to bring sandwiches? <laughs> First of all, I'm too tired to make sandwiches when I get home. <laughs> but then you go and make me carry food. So the little exercise I get from swimming, I come out and I say, wow, that barbecue smell good. <laughs> so, exactly. So we go back to our socialization. So if we go in for a little hike, we're going somewhere, just go for the hike. You carry some water, right? You're going hike, you go for the hike. You go for a hike and come down and get eat up. I'll carry some fruits and vegetables. Yes? Yes, all right. Um, we really look, mango, if you're not diabetic, mango is, a, mango is an excellent fruit, eh? Except for the diabetic. You go eat your one mango as a diabetic, but then the one patient I tell that is big buff tree she had in her yard. <laughs> which is like three mangoes. <laughs> so she said, Doc, I only have one. I passed by one desktop. She said, Doc, you want some mangoes? Me said, this is not one mango for you. <laughs> to 
try to take a graft in all the bim bims, please. <laughs> so now I have to contextualize when I say mangoes, okay? <laughs> so we're looking at the high levels of obesity, the causes. Um, now we have um, comfort eating. Yeah, you're watching your movie at home. Even if you're going to a movie, you want to go and watch a movie, you go to watch a movie. Why you have to eat? Think about it. It's just associations. Comfort eating. Technological advances. Now you have what? I won't call any names, but delivery places that delivering all over St. Vincent. Right? From any food place, good and bad. Right? I say, oh, I feel like cooking. And then you order the whole pizza for three of you. And then what? You eat a little extra. Boy, they say, can't waste it. This box can't fit in the fridge. All oh, you better finish this tonight. Right? So, increase the number of sodas, lack of physical activity. Outside any school, they always have somebody recycling soda bottles. Right? And you're going to see how many soda bottles actually get consumed on a daily basis by our, our, our school children. I mean, I'm talking tablespoons of sugars, these drinks include. Eh? So something as simple as that. And you say, can't go draconian. It's free choice. You can't tell me what to drink. But I think we should remove it from our schools. That's just how I feel. All right. Even some of the box juices, the content of sugar in it is so high, they have acquired a taste for high sugar contents. The cereals, right? Gone are the day when it's oat and it had a little bit of sugar for anything. These cereals are now loaded with sugars. All right, so we look at it, that tailored with the tablet. So in addition to a lot of the foods with significantly higher sugar levels, now the children ain't gone on the field, lunchtime to play football and thing, you know, tablet, right? Lack of understanding of appropriate nutrition. This is how I ate as a child, generational, all right? Who is teaching? We have dietitians, we have nutritionists, but you only really get referred to them if you have significant obesity or if you get diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension or some stomach issue, all right? You don't routinely see them go into a school and say, let's do a session, all right? In dietary week, they go around, right? But it's not enough, all right? So when they do their talks, you now have to do your talk and impart the knowledge to persons, okay? Um, you, you do have medical and genetic factors that influence it. You also do have medical conditions that can cause obesity. That's not the majority, eh? That's not the majority. Most of it is lifestyle, all right? Um, so we have significant rise. Solutions, increase of activity, get the information that we need, um, get active. This was one of the guide groups um, very involved in, well, in mentoring through family members in terms of the guides. Um, so we had a very nice nutrition session. It was followed by an exercise activity by one of the um, physical trainers around and they did not have anything to eat. They had some water to drink. <laughs> and we thought we overall. So we could actually calculate whether we go, are um, overweight or not by a simple calculation. Um, you could just change the slides for me, call a BMI, and that would tell you. You could plug it in on your phone, you, you Google BMI, put your weight in, put your height in, and it would tell you which range you fall in to see what's going on. It would tell you if you're underweight, don't see any underweight people here. If it would tell you if you're thin for your height, it would tell you if you're healthy weight, if you're overweight, or if you're obese, all right? So depending on what that number is, um, it would give you different readings. All right. I want to take the opportunity to thank you again for inviting me to share some tidbits. So we did diabetes, we did hypertension, we did obesity. I think these are some of the rampant things going on. We have a lot of other things going on. Eh? We have stomach conditions. We have cancers right? that we don't talk about. People not doing the mammograms. If you're over 40 in the church here today and you never had a mammogram or you didn't have one in the last one to two years, please go and do one, right? If you're over 40, you're supposed to have a mammogram every one to two years. If you're over 21, then you need a pap smear, all right? Don't tell me you're not sexually active, your husband done dead, are your children big? It's true, it's true. These are things why persons don't get pap smears. 
you have a cervix. As I say, when I say, Doc, me, what me need with mammogram, I say, have breasts. Yes, okay. Then once you have breasts, you should do it. Same thing. If you have a cervix, you need to check and see if you have abnormal cells on it. Why diagnosing these things with early abnormalities could prevent significant complications, all right? Stool testing, right? You check your stool and see if any blood in it. You're over 45 to 50, colon cancer is in St. Vincent, right? Over 45 to 50, let your district doctor, your, your primary care doctor, write for you to check your stools. Once a year, you check your stool and see if any blood hidden in it. You don't have blood hidden in it, wonderful. Do it again next year, all right? These are what we call preventative medicine, all right? If you have blood in your stool, you know, sometimes the mammogram could detect a lump in your breast years before somebody's hand could detect it. Years, I said, yes, years. So what are we waiting for? We wait until a big fungate in mass and say, well, don't go bad here now, you know? So let us be proactive and not ignore obvious warning signs when it comes to our health. There are things called screening, where we check for stuff before we develop complications for it, and that we could have a healthy church, not only spiritually healthy, but we now also have to cater for our physical health. Thank you very much.